Good morning, Kara City. I am Barbie Martinez. For those of you who don't know, I was a founding member here at Kara City back in the Little White Chapel. I have since moved away, but I am always happy when Chris and Nathan extend the invitation for me to come back and to spend a Sunday with you. It's the greatest privilege of my life, and I know that it's been a rough week in Houston. So if you have managed to get here and you don't have power, praise God. You've come to the house of God where it's nice and cool in here. So I am sorry about all that you've been through. I have two daughters that live here. They were without power. And um, I know what a mess it can be. So I'm glad you made it this morning. We are continuing in the sermon series, Yahweh. And I have the privilege of wrapping it up today. And I am super excited to do that with you. So we will be back in Exodus 34, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles or get your Bible app ready. So my husband and I uh, just recently celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. Um, thanks. I often joke that at our wedding 27 years ago, that everybody in the room was thinking this. This is never going to last. No way these two are going to make it. We did everything you're not supposed to do. We did it all backwards. We were a recipe for divorce. We were also a little bit stupid and naive. So there's that. I grew up in New Orleans where the favorite pastime is fine dining. I love to eat out. And I mean, I like to do it all. Like go to the restaurant, get the cocktails. We're in church, I'm sorry. Have appetizers, a medium rare filet. No, we're not leaving. We're gonna have dessert and coffee too, right? Do it all, stay for hours, talk around the table. I love to be dressed up. I love to be waited on. My husband grew up in Brownsville, Texas. There is no Commander's Palace. There is no Galatoire's. And when we first got married, we didn't have a lot of money. And so for us to go out to eat was a really special occasion. So I remember early in our marriage, we went out to eat. And I was so excited because I was like, we're doing all the things, right? But every time I would suggest he would complain about how much that cost and do we really need to get that and can't we just go home and have ice cream? And then he said these words, Barbie, a steak is a steak. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? Blasphemy. A steak is not just a steak. I do have to tell y'all, he watched the first service and he just texted me and he said, a steak is still a steak. Um, anyway, I remember thinking in that moment, who did I marry? Like, am I going to have to deal with this man for the rest of my life who sucks the fun out of every meal? And I think all the married people in the room would agree that the day you married your spouse, you thought you knew them. You sure did, didn't you? And then you found out, I really don't know this guy at all. I didn't know a thing. I thought I did. So you're probably wondering where this story is going. It has a point. So this sermon series is all about knowing God. Lots of people believe in God. The problem is, is that the word God means different things to different people. The God of the Bible, the God that we proclaim in this church, he is the God, the one true God. And this whole series has been challenging us to know this God. Pastor and author A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God 
is the most important thing about us. A long time ago, one of my Bible teachers put it this way. We want to worship the God who is, not the God I want. So I'm going to ask a couple questions this morning. Just keep these in the back of your mind. What comes into your mind when you think about God? Right now, how well do you know God? Are you shaping God into your image, or are you allowing God to shape you into his? How does knowing God impact your life? The last three weeks, Nathan and Sean have walked through a list of character traits as God chose to reveal them to Moses in Exodus 34. We're going to read our passage again. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Our God, the compassionate and gracious God, the God who is slow to anger, the God who abounds, I love that word, abounds in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. It's a beautiful picture of a beautiful God. Did you know that these verses are the most quoted verses in the Bible by the Bible? One author says, Exodus 34, 6 through 7 is not a one-off descriptor, a peripheral passing comment. In this text, we climb into the very center of who God is. And today, we get to the final words. I am the Lord who forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Our God forgives wickedness. Our God forgives rebellion. And our God forgives sin. Three different words in English and three different words in Hebrew. And I just want to unpack them really quickly. The first word, wickedness, is sometimes translated iniquity. The word in Hebrew is avon, and it means perversity or depravity. Think bent, twisted, distorted. This word encompasses outright evil, but it also encompasses just like evil motives and actions, but also twisted motives, doing good things for the wrong reasons, and it includes all the ways that we're bent towards selfishness. When I look around the world, I see a lot that's just off, right? It's just It's just not right. It's not good. And when I'm really honest, I see it in myself. The second word is rebellion, sometimes translated transgression. In Hebrew, it is the word pesha, and it is best summed up in the word betrayal. This is a breaking of trust. When one person betrays another, Nations can betray nations, and we can betray our God when we worship things other than God. To transgress is to choose intentionally to disobey, to violate the trust of another person. Think adultery, gossip, hypocrisy. 
lying, cheating, when we don't do what we say we're going to do, these are all forms of pesha. The last word is sin. In Hebrew, it is the word hata, which literally means missing the mark. Now, Nathan has talked about this many times in all the years that I have known him. And whenever he says that, there's a natural question that follows. What's the mark? How can I know if I'm missing the mark? And to understand this word, we have to go back to Genesis 1 and 2, where we learn what the mark is. We discover in Genesis 1 and 2 why we were created. We were created to be images of God. The mark or the goal is to represent our God in the world, to act as his ambassadors, and to reflect his good character into the world. So sin is when we do not image God. Jesus said that we are to love God and love our neighbor. So we miss the mark when we don't love God and when we don't love our neighbor. When we hoard for ourselves at the expense of others, greed, indifference, that's sin. Failing to honor another human being is a failure to honor God, and it is a sin. So I would argue that these three words, together, they cover the entire spectrum of human brokenness. Sins we commit knowingly, sins we commit unconsciously, selfishness, greed, my disregard for the pain of others, sin that we all recognize as sin, and sin that sometimes doesn't look like sin. All of it, all of it is forgiven. God forgives it all because God is forgiving. It's who he is. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He's abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness, and he forgives. He forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. It's as if God wants to make sure, and I want to make sure, that you know there is nothing outside the forgiveness of God. It's all able to be forgiven. And this is true in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God did not change. His forgiveness is all over the pages of the Bible from beginning to end. King David knew depravity and perversity. He was an adulterer and a murderer someone who had a bent toward selfishness at the expense of others. And when he turned to the Lord, here is how he viewed his forgiveness. We're going to read Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For night, day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Did you see all three words in there? David knew he was guilty of wickedness, rebellion, and sin, but he knew that when he turned and confessed to God, he was forgiven and he was blessed. If you have asked for forgiveness, are you still living in verse 3, wasting away and groaning if you have asked for forgiveness, if you have acknowledged your sin, the Lord's hand is not heavy on you anymore. 
You are forgiven. And notice, the guilt of your sin is forgiven. And the God revealed to Moses in our passage today is the same God who repeatedly extends forgiveness and then comes as the divine human, Jesus. If you want to know what God's forgiveness looks like, we need only look at how Jesus extended forgiveness. We're going to look at three stories really quickly. One in Luke 5. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now we're going to look at a story that's in Luke 7. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Last one, Luke 23, as Jesus was crucified, he said these words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Did you notice that in all three stories, the person in the story doesn't even ask for forgiveness? Jesus simply extends it. If Jesus is the revelation of God in the flesh, the same God of Exodus 34, then we can know what God's forgiveness looks like, and it is freely given. There's no jumping through hoops. There's no begging and pleading. God's forgiveness flows from his compassionate, gracious, loving heart towards his creation. We ask, he forgives. It's that simple. It's who he is. Do you believe it? Do you really believe that God forgives you? And if you do, what difference does it make? Strange question to ask, I know. I'm forgiven, so what? I ask it, because so many people will say they know that God forgives them, but then they live like they aren't forgiven. And I know what that feels like. I committed a grievous sin as a young woman, and I begged God to forgive me. And I'd tell you that I believed he did, but it didn't change anything in my life. Because you can be forgiven and still live condemned. You can be forgiven and still live in bondage. And you can be forgiven and still live hopeless. I have known so many people, and I was one of them, who had begged the Lord for forgiveness but I was consumed by constant guilt and shame. You might hear a person say something like this, I know God forgives me, but I cannot forgive myself. As if God's forgiveness isn't enough. I think 
that this is partly because God's forgiveness is so freely and generously given that it's sometimes hard to believe it's true. Moses watched as God forgave his people over and over again. And the prophets say over and over again, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive them. God's poised and ready to forgive. Romans 8.1, which is one of my favorite verses, and I think we should all read it out loud together so you can hear yourself say these words. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I couldn't hear you. Let's do it again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us in Galatians 5 that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. What is the sin that haunts you? What do you think you deserve for that sin? What would be a just punishment in your mind? How about a lashing? Would that be enough? How about people mocking you and screaming, mock, saying that you're a fraud? Would that be enough? How about some humiliation? Would that be enough? How about death? Would execution be enough? Because all that already happened. Jesus took the punishment you and I deserved for our sin. The big ones and the little ones, the ones in the past and the ones in the future. He was the final sacrifice for sin. And it was motivated by his abounding compassion, grace, and love so that you could be free. Is that enough? Or would you tell him that you still don't forgive yourself? Too many Christians have been forgiven but not freed. If you are still punishing yourself and living under the weight of guilt and hiding in shame, afraid to talk about it, afraid of the judgment of other people, afraid of condemnation, hear your God today. He forgives you. He forgave you the moment you asked. Believe it. Forgive yourself. In the Gospel of John, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well in the heat of the day. She comes alone when no one can bother her. Shame seeks solitude. And Jesus meets her there. And in a beautiful series of questions, Jesus opens her up to the truth of her life. He helps her see it all. And then he shares with her the truth that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, our God in the flesh. The word forgiveness is never used in this story. And yet the healing balm of forgiveness is all over it. This woman who sought solitude runs back to her town and tells everyone about this Jesus and that he knows everything she's ever done. The love of Jesus swallows her shame and it frees her to speak the truth with boldness and without shame. 
When you have accepted the forgiveness of Christ, you no longer fear speaking the worst out loud. When you have accepted the forgiveness of Christ, you don't hide anymore. When you have accepted the forgiveness of Christ, you can't help talking about it. That is true freedom. Seeing ourselves through the loving eyes of Jesus, not the condemning eyes of sin. Now, before we wrap up, I don't want to leave without addressing how verse 7 ends in Exodus 34. So we're going to look at the end of this passage. Verse 7, maintaining love to thousands, and everyone says, amen, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, amen. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Boo. Yikes. That last sentence gets people twisted up in knots because it sounds like God is going to punish my kid for what I've done, and I don't like that. But that's not at all what this passage is about. As a matter of fact, most scholars agree that the word for punishes in this verse is better translated, observes. That's the primary Hebrew meaning of the word. Furthermore, we know that God doesn't punish kids for their parents' sin because he said so in the book of Ezekiel. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Whenever we come to passages in the Bible that are hard and that are confusing to us and make it sound like God's contradicting himself, we've got to dig and we've got to get to the wisdom that's underneath. And there's some really profound wisdom in that verse that makes us all go. And the wisdom is this. Sin has consequences. Our children watch what we do. Our children often do what we do. God is fully aware of the infectious nature of sin within families. But when you look at this passage as a whole, and you see that the Lord maintains love to thousands, and what's understood is to thousands of generations, then to the third and the fourth seems really small. Do you see the disparity? Imagine this passage sitting on some scales with God's love and grace to thousands on one side and God's justice on the other. When you read it, you can hear the scales dropping on the side of his abounding love and grace to a thousand generations. His bent is toward that if God has a bend he is so ready to forgive. He is so ready to extend love and grace. But it doesn't make his justice less real or less powerful. This is the gospel, the good news. To understand the love and justice of God, we need only look at the cross. Anyone who places their faith in Christ receives the gift of mercy Justice for your sins and mine is placed squarely on the outstretched arms of Jesus. But if we do not turn to Jesus to receive mercy, God's justice will have its way with us. I think it would be a fair statement that of all the people in the Bible, Moses knew God best. Moses first encounters God at the burning bush. This bush is on fire, but not consumed, and God reveals himself as I am the self-existent one. Moses then gets to watch 
as God unleashes his power on the little gods of Egypt as the all-powerful God. And then Moses gets to stand on the shore of the Red Sea and in trust lift his staff and watch God split the sea to redeem and rescue his people. Moses knows God. And yet, in chapter 33, right before this passage, Moses makes this request of the Lord. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Moses has seen all of that, and he wants to know the Lord more. And this should be the cry of every believer's heart. Lord, more. I want to know you more. And what is remarkable is God says, yes. Our God wants to be known We've come to the end of this series called Yahweh. And if you didn't know it before, I hope you know now that our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he is just. And that is good news. We serve an amazing God. But I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked about forgiveness. What difference does it make that you know this? Why do we need to know this? It's good news for us personally. In Genesis 1 and 2, before sin entered the world again, remember the reason we were created, to be the image of God and to rule and reign over creation with him. In the New Testament, we are told multiple times that we are being transformed into the image of Christ. We need to know so that we can become My husband and I have come a long way from a steak is a steak days. We have lived together. We've raised three children together. We're growing older by the minute together. We also now know one another in ways that I could not have imagined 27 years ago. And strangely, in those 27 years, we have become more and more alike. I think it's part of becoming one flesh. You begin to look like the one you know and love. When Moses asks God to know him more, God reveals to Moses that which he and therefore we can image I'll never split the Red Sea. I am not all-powerful, and you are not either. I can never be everywhere all at once like God, and I don't know everything, and neither do you. We can't image God's omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence, but we can be compassionate, and we can be gracious and loving And we can forgive like our Father forgives. As a follower of Jesus, your life and mine should reflect these characteristics into the world. Do compassion and graciousness flow from your life? Are you abounding in love? Are you slow to get angry? Are you forgiving? Are you imaging God with your life? with your words, on social media, in the workplace, in your home? 
Do people see God? See the God of Exodus 34 when they see you as freely and abundantly forgiven and loved people, it should make a difference in how we live. We should be the most loving, generous, gracious, kind, forgiving, free people, even if it costs us everything. And like Moses, we should be in constant pursuit of knowing and becoming more like the God we serve. Let's pray.